I'd like to welcome everyone to, uh, to this first episode of Conversations. Uh, I'm Kevin Doyle. I'll be your host for a series of them, I guess, through the winter months. Uh, some of you may recognize the, uh, the format as being the old brown bag lunch. Uh, and Billy uh, Cap has been very gracious in, in giving me some guidance about that and, and how it was organized and so forth. And I think we'll continue to be focused on historians and authors and that type of thing uh, that hopefully you'll find kind of enriching about uh, living here at Southport or maybe about the area or whatever. Uh, I got this job because just before COVID hit, we had just moved in and there was a speaker that was speaking from Falmouth. And I said, oh, I know that guy. Billy was in Hawaii at the time. So I said, well, I can do that. I'll introduce the guy. Well, you know what happens when you do something once, right? <laughs> this is it. So, so that's going to be me. And what I was thinking was, you know, in, uh, in moving here, we've, we've uh, lived down here. Pat's in the back there. She's wearing her wampum because she knows that today is a special day. Uh, and uh, we've lived here for 50 years. We've had a place down in Falmouth. But it surprised me when uh, COVID broke and they talked about 140 people have moved into Mashpee since, since uh, COVID into, into Southport. So I thought, well, one of the things that you really want to know when you move into a place is what's happened there? Who are they? What's, what's going on in Mashpee? So that was why I decided that this first piece should be about Mashpee. Is this already going or am I? <laughs> Uh, so, for those of you who didn't know Billy, by the way, because you might not have been here when she was here either, uh, Billy, and you might, you, you'd recognize her husband, uh, David Cap's name, because David writes the Village Voices and solicits uh, th that sort of thing. And Billy and David were the first ones to receive the uh, Citizen Award for Southport. Is that, is that me or is that something else? Is that it? Oh. oh, now you can hear me though. So what, what, what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, about Mashpee. And when it comes time to talk about Mashpee, you try to go to the source. And that's what we're doing today. And a lot of you already know uh, Chief Flying Eagle, Earl Mills. He, he's been a neighbor. You might have eaten in his restaurants. But I kind of wanted to spend a little bit of time telling you about who he is, for those of you who might not know him. Is this going to be a problem? So there. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Earl Mills is a legend. And he's been doomed, he's been deemed that, and he's lived that. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you get doomed to those things. Okay. Being a legend. Now, Earl is a, Earl is a guy, he, he wrote a book which was called Son of Mashpee. And he is the original son of Mashpee in many different ways. Not only was he born and raised in Mashpee, but his parents were key uh, elements of, of uh, Mashpee society when Mashpee was managed by the Wampanoags up until uh, about 1940 or so. You've all driven into town, you've seen a sign outside that says uh, Mashpee, land of the Wampanoag, and then it says uh, incorporated 1870. Uh, that line kind of misses the point. Okay, that's, that's not what it's all about. Um, 
when it was incorporated doesn't matter. You know, the Wampanoags were here to meet the pilgrims. If there were Vikings that came to the shore, they were here to meet the Vikings. Okay. They've been here. This is their land. It continues to be their land. It will always be their land. That's the way it's been. So I, I find that it's, it's kind of unfortunate the sign says it that way. I always thought that the sign should say, Mashpee, land of the Wampanoags, since ever. You know, just get over it. And, and I think that that's, that's the way it is. But he, uh, so he's, he's been a son of Mashpee. He, he was a graduate of the Mashpee Public Schools. And then after uh, going to the schools here in Mashpee, he went to the high school in Falmouth because there was no high school here in, in, uh, in Mashpee. So he went there and he was a, a great athlete in the high school. Uh, and after high school, he joined the Army. And for two years, 1946 to 1948, he was a, he was a combat engineer in Korea. After completing his tour in Korea after the two years, he had earned his right to the GI Bill. So he took the GI Bill and he got his a bachelor's degree in physical education, recreation, and health. He stayed on and continued to get a, a master's degree then in education. And he came back and he, he started his career teaching in the Falmouth Public Schools where he taught for the next 31 years. So he had a long career there. In 1974, he stopped being the athletic director. Uh, and 10 years later, he picked up the position as the director of physical education, recreation, and health. So 31 years later, he's, he's got the job that he set out to train for uh, immediately out of, out of the Army and out of college. So he did that. Uh, some of you know it, along the line, while he, was, while he was teaching school, he has also spent 16 years as a, as a uh, chef, as a gourmet chef, actually. 16 years at the Kunamesset Inn and 23 years at the Papanesset Inn, uh, along the line working at Wimpy's as, as well uh, in Osterville. And then in 1972, his mother had urged him along the line, he was working so hard, people recognized him, they knew who he was and so forth, and she kept saying to him, why don't you open your own restaurant? Finally in 1972 he did. And he, he opened a place called The Flume, Who's eating there? Some of you must have already. There you go. You recognize these people? <laughs> huh? some, of them, some of them are singing songs and wearing red hats. Would that help? Uh, and, and so there he was in, at the flume. And, and while he was there, he also wrote two cookbooks. So here he is now. He's uh, been, a, been a, a, a special chef for, for uh, lots of years, 16 at the Kuna Mesa, 23 at, uh, at the uh, Papanesset Inn, and then his own restaurant from 1972 to 2004. Now, some people would probably say, he's had a pretty good life. You know, that's, that's a, well, a life well lived. He's done a lot of things in his years. But that's only one side of the equation. I'm going to take you back to 1956 again. And now Earl is just out of the, uh, the army. He, he's, he's been, well, let me take that back. He got out of the army in, in uh, 1948. Eight years later, 1956, he's four years out of college. He's got his master's degree now in education. And the elders in the tribe came up and said, we have an issue here. We've had a temporary and interim chief with the, with the tribe for the last several years. Since World War II ended, it's been kind of tough to get the regular chief in place. So they approached Earl and said, we need to invigorate the tribe. We need to get this thing started. We need to bring back our culture and, and treat it like it should be. We want you to be our leader. We want you to be our chief. Now, Earl's got a good career going already, but he recognized the need of the tribe, and he said, said 
okay, I'll accept that challenge if that's what you want. And the tribal council met, unanimously said, yep, you're the guy, you're who we want. So they, they granted the, the, the uh, supreme sachem came down from the Wampanoag tribe and, and installed Earl Mills as the chief of the Mashpee tribe of the Wampanoag Federation. He made him chief of the Wampanoags, a title and a position that he holds for a lifetime. And with it, he gave him the name. And he said, you will be Flying Eagle. And that's where that came from. And it was a name that had promise. It was a name that had direction. It had a name with expectations. And he lived those promises and expectations every single day. When he became the chief, he said, well, we got some fixing to do. We got things we have to, do, we have to work on. And so he studied, he researched, he visited other tribes, he talked with former elders, he continued to talk with the elders, he wrote a book about talking to the elders, and went right to work, starting with his family. And we have Roxanne and Shelley right here right now, his two daughters, uh, who were Casado, Casado, I knew I'd get it wrong eventually, uh, and Aquila. Uh, and of course, I think you all know his son as well, Earl Jr., who right now is probably across the hall sorting our mail, getting ready to deliver it. Uh, also imbued with the spirit. And that's where he started building the tribe, right there in his own, in his own home. He said, this is, this is the way we're going to do it. And, and his own family set the pace, and they started organizing and moving forward. So they did that, and they brought in the powwow. We'll talk about the powwow. We'll, we'll talk about those types of things. And Earl's champing at the bit, ready to go here. So, but I wanted you to know that in, so as, as he brought back the powwow, he, he installed all these things. In 1966, uh, the... I see, in 1960, uh, Chief Flying Eagle was present at the uh, commissioning of the National Seashore, representing the Wampanoag tribe. Uh, when it came time for Mashpee, Mashpee Commons was being built, Chief Flying Eagle was a, a part of the negotiation team, and that's why today you'll find a, a, a Wampanoag trading post in Mashpee Commons. Paula, Paula Peters, obviously, is running it right now, that was all part of the negotiations as, as the Mashpee Commons was built. And then as he was, uh, when, when the uh, new Seabury came along, he was uh, very instrumental in having new Seabury help to fund a project very near and dear to his heart, which was the uh, old Indian meeting house, which is just around the corner from us. I'm sure you've passed it. That was in disrepair. It had been in disrepair for 50 years. And Chief Flying Eagle said, no, this, this is our, it's the oldest church on Cape Cod. It's conceivably the oldest church building in the country, built in 1684. And he set out to fix it. And he did. And he did it with some of the money from the uh, New Seabury development. So those were all things that he did and that, that's the career that was going on simultaneously with everything that he was doing on his civilian life. He one time used an expression with me talking about having two feet in two canoes. And as I started to research that, I think you can hear and see those two feet and those two canoes. So we have a, we have a few people who have come to see him today. And the most recent thing actually was... Uh, Katie Atchison, who's sitting down in front here, who's the executive director of the uh, Chamber of Commerce in Mashpee, just a couple of weeks ago presented uh, Earl with an award for being Distinguished Service Award. And I think as, as I kind of cataloged some of the things he'd done, you can see the service that he's done for the town. We have the archivist for, for, for Mashpee right here as well. Uh, Ava Costello is sitting here. And uh, she assures me that most of the catalogs in, uh, in, in town have Earl's fingerprints on them, one way or another. 
And that's how it goes. Even the, even the cameraman, we're, we're talking here, uh, Chris Ball is down there. Uh, he's the executive director of Mashpee Television. And when I called and I said, we'd, we'd really like to record the chief's uh, presentation here today. He, I said, it'll be about an hour. He goes, no, I don't kind of talk for just an hour. You know? <laughs> so, so, so here he is, he's ready to go. He may break into a song, you don't know, you know, whatever, whatever it takes, but it's a great pleasure to be on the stage with Earl Mills, Chief Flying Eagle of the Wampanoag Tribe. <laughs> Suit yourself. Would you like to stand? I think I'd like to stand up. Okay. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. It's great to be here. I wasn't sure I could come because I I, I'm a storyteller, as my father was, but I began now in my later years of not forgetting, but losing my way. Go out of the room, come back, I'll finish the story. <laughs> you know? So anyway, I was born uh, in March 30th, 1929, in Down Street, Mashby. Down Mashby was Down Street and Up Street in South Mashby, down near the bay in the ocean. And my mother was Emma Oakley Mills, who was upstreet. Oh, she said, I never knew your father, because we lived upstreet. And they were in the center of the town, town hall and, 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 and all the stores and things like that. And my father lived downstreet, so she said, oh, we never went downstreet. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, my mother was tax collector and treasurer of the town when I was a young man growing up for 33 years, both the jobs. There's a stone in my compound now within, with my mother's name on it, and the street is named after her, Emma Oakley Mills Way. It goes into my compound next to the home down on Main Street, 130. She also was the head of the 4-H, Oh, for like about 40 years. She ran the Grange for about 50 years. She was, in that, she was called the Miss Republican of Cape Cod. People came to the house, all the governors and assistant governors and, 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 and Governor Brooks, I mean, uh, the, uh, no, I didn't Governor Brooks, but Senator. Senator Brooks, they came to the house to talk to my mother. And when my mother went to the town meetings and she stood up, everybody would say, be quiet, be quiet, Emma's speaking. And everybody would stop and Emma would take over. My father, 15 different voted positions in the town between selectman, police chief, head of the, the, the dump, uh, you name it, head of the shellfish, um, Fire warden uh, goes on and on, and his name is on that stone. He was also a guide, a hunting and fishing guide for the rich and famous that all came here. And they all came here, hundreds and hundreds of rich and famous. Among those, Daniel Webster. Daniel Webster came here and fished in the Mashpee River with my great uncle Solomon Adequin at the Sod Adequin Hotel. And, at, and, and Webster left, left a letter about his fishing there that he wanted the people to remember. We have a letter written by Webster when he went fishing and how he fished and so forth in the Mashpee River, the greatest river of all, he called it. I had six, there were six siblings. I'm the next to the youngest. It was like my mother and father had two families, because my sister Delcina, who was the baker in my restaurant, and she baked it, Kunameset, and she baked it, Papaneset, when I worked there, and at Kunameset when I worked there. And where am I now? Oh, siblings, two families, Delcina and Lincoln, 
who was killed in World War II, and I'll tell you that little story, uh, at just near the end of the war with a time bomb in the ground, 1945, okay? And so I, I only remember my sister Delcina and Lincoln after they were out of the house. Lincoln was in New York. My sister Delcina was married, had a, two young kids right next door, and I babysat those kids when I was five and six years old. That was the difference. I went to school. I had to walk to school. And I walked to school because that camera down there was the line that you had to be behind. It was a mile from the school. And if you were beyond that, you took the bus. Well, we were from that camera to here was my homestead. So I had to walk to school. I had three different paths that I walked through the woods. In eight years of walking to the school, I never went with anybody that I can remember. And yet there were some young people who were around my age within that area that went to school the same time I did. But I never walked with anyone else. And I went through the paths. And that's why, how I learned all the herbal plants and all the different animals that I uh, could track during the snowy seasons. And I, I learned about uh, uh, squaw moccasins and, and, and the mint leaves and, and, and the different herbal plants that my mother and father would pick as I'd walk through these wooded paths on the way to the yellow schoolhouse. Yellow schoolhouse had an outhouse out in the back and a woodshed right near it. So the first four years of school, and when I went home, the first four years of my elementary school, I had a bellyache every day going home from school. Why? I never went to the outhouse. We had an outhouse, but it was our outhouse. But if I had to tinkle, I went out in the woods. I don't know what the girls did, but I know the guys went out in the woods. All my teachers, I can tell you all my teachers from high school, from elementary school to high school, even into college. And a yellow schoolhouse, it was called, was built in 1890. And it was still standing when I went into the first grade. Two, two grades in the first room first and second, two grades in third and fourth grade, and then in the last four grades, all in one room down at the bottom with a wood stove where the guys who weren't doing well in school would go out and chop wood in the woodshed. <laughs> Miss Consolini was my first teacher. She was a sandwich. Oh, stayed in touch with her to the day she passed. I did her eulogy. That's how long I stayed in touch with her. Wonderful teacher. Everybody knew her. Third and fourth grade, Miss Marjorie Bragg was my teacher. Graduated from a school in Maine. She fought for two years, then they had Catherine Rogers for the balance of the third and fourth grade years. And each of the teachers you could either play the piano or something, because they had to do other things besides teach the classes. We'd put on plays. We'd put on all kinds of uh, shows. And we'd do plays uh, uh, representing the old history uh, of our people. And do things with, about Squanto and about the Indian's past. I lost my place. So you talk about um, your teacher, Mrs. Oh, OK. And Miss Rogers only stayed for so long because she used to go live in Katuit. And the bands, your big bands, used to come to Katuit. And so she got involved in the drug thing with them. Wonderful teacher, but they had to let her go. And then in the fifth and sixth grade, uh, fifth and sixth, let's see. Fifth and sixth, 
I had Mr. Coombs, one of my mentors and a wonderful, wonderful teacher. A school was named after him. He was our historian of the tribe. Had him there. And he got his education at Bridgewater by thumbing up there and then coming back during the season when he refereed football and refereed basketball in the different schools. And lo and behold, when I went into the, into, into the, into the uh, uh, seventh and eighth grade, who did I have again? Had to have Mr. Coombs again. He was now the principal. He was not only the principal, but he taught both grades again. We had all kinds of activities, and we, would, we didn't have a gymnasium or a stage, so the guys who had bulldozers and stuff, they'd bring their trailer in and pull it across the street in the field, and we would put on plays on that big low boy. We would decorate it. One of the things that I did when, I, when, when we did it like a, uh, a, like a show, I sang a song. Every time it rains, it rains pennies from heaven. Don't you know each cloud contains pennies from heaven? You'll find your fortune falling all over town. Make sure that your umbrella is upside down. Trade it for a package of sunshine and flowers. For you know the things you love, you must have showers. But when you hear it thunder, don't run under a tree, cause there'll be pennies from heaven for you and me. That's a song I remember. We used to go up to New Bedford after uh, working on a play or uh, some kind of a program in our school, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, uh, and uh, up until the eighth grade, and we work on things. Then we go to WNBH in New Bedford, and we'd be on the radio. I, I know where the radio station was, what street it was on, Union Street, upstairs. Now, how we got to that station, I can't tell you. How we got home, can't tell you. <laughs> but I remember singing the song I sang, the Yankee Doodle Dandy. <laughs> I sang over the radio. This was on WNBH, on shows that we put on. Uh, Mr. Simeon Kinsley, he had graduated from Harvard. He was the, the uh, principal and teacher before I started school. He stayed with my aunt next door, my aunt Flora Burst Amos. He boarded with them. The, teacher, the teachers that came to teach in Mashpee boarded with the people in the community. Mr. Mr. Fennerty, who was the teacher and principal when I first started school, he had been, he had been over to England and he, he, he had, had been a tennis player. And he, uh, what, what's the big tennis thing in, in England? He did Wimbledon, he refereed uh, tennis in Wimbledon. He also re uh, refereed all of it in, in New York. And he was our principal. I left, left Mashpee, graduated. Uh, before I graduated, though, from, from the eighth grade, I was visiting my grandfather and grandmother. My grandfather had built a store, and it was a, a, a variety store and, and, a, and, a, and a, um, a, bait, a bait and fishing and hunting store. And of course, as a young boy of 10 and 12, I already had a, a 410. That's a gun, a 410. I had a gun because I used to go hunting. Sometimes I'd bring home dinner. I'd bring home rabbits. My father rented 
boats. He was a hunter and a fisherman guide. He was the best fly fisherman I ever saw in my life. And I saw Ted Williams, and he could put Ted Williams in his back pocket. <laughs> he could because he did it for sustenance. I went to Hall School. Hall School was seven, eight, and nine in Falmouth. I was in the ninth grade. Oh, I have to go back. And, and before, before I graduated from the eighth grade, I visited my grandfather. We were going to go fishing. He was going to go help me dig worms. He came out of the house. He said, boy, you, know, you, got, the, you, got, the, you got the shovel? You got the cane? You know, the old timers, you got organized and you had to get ready. You couldn't go looking for it after you went out. I said, yes, sir, Gramp. About that time, he fell over. I went into the house. I said, Grandpa fell over. They ran outside. My brother Lincoln was there. My grandfather had, a, had died right there. He died right near me. He ran to the post office because the town hall wasn't open during the week because it was only certain days the town hall was open. Went up to the post office where my Aunt Flora son ran the post office and called Dr. Higgins down in Marston's Mills. Did Dr. Higgins come in his car? He had a car. No, he came on his motorcycle, as he said. <laughs> Pronounced my grandfather dead. So that's just, and then soon after that, my, my grandmother had a stroke. And, and talking about restaurants and, and feeding people, I fed my grandmother. I made the gruel. You know what gruel is? It's a cornmeal mixture. After you made the dumplings, you put a little sugar in it, and maybe some people put a little salt, and it was good for you. I fed my grandmother. If she walked outside, She'd have her cane and she'd have her arm on my shoulder. And I'd hang on to her and walk around with her. Then go back in the house and I'd heat up some uh, a corn chowder, for instance, that had been strained because she couldn't eat pure corn chowder because of the hull. It would choke her. And I would feed her with a spoon, one of, one of the most feeling things I ever did in my life. Let's see, where am I here? During that time, oh, I went to, the, went to Falmouth, went to school in the Falmouth, uh, and, uh, and uh, I was in the ninth grade, and uh, we, we, I played ball there and everything, and then uh, we had a ceremony. I graduated from the ninth grade because the seven, eight, and nine was one school, and the auditorium in Falmouth was part of the Hall School. So when I graduated from the ninth grade there, I went right across the street to the Lawrence High School, named after the Lawrence family. And that school was no longer there. The Hall School was no longer there. Only the name of it, because the original Hall School they demolished. The original school that I went to in Mashby was gone because I went to the Samuel G. Davis School for the last four years. Hall School was demolished. The only thing they saved was the cupola, which is down the street from the library there. Oh, let's see, 1943-46, I, and, and that's in the summertime. This was the year after I graduated from, from, from uh, Mashby. That year, 42, I graduated from eighth grade. And then I, that year, that summer, I got a job at Papa Nesset. I was the busboy for breakfast. I had a little white jacket with my dark pants. And I would bring, set the table out on the patio, looking out into the ocean. Set the table, bring the water, 
bring the dishes out from the kitchen, uh, take, ask people if they wanted more water, more coffee, and then take the dishes when they left and go. And I did pots and pans. And then when the purveyors came and they brought the lobsters or they brought the, uh, the chicken, and when they brought chicken in those days, the chicken came with its head still on, the legs still on, and it, it eviscerated all, and all in ice. I'd have to put that stuff all away. And then with the chickens, I'd have to take it down into, into the downstairs. Now, I was, I, was, I was only, what, 12, 13 years old? I was using the Cleveland. They, they went, you can't, the law is you can't use a cleaver and a knife till you're at least 16. I was using one, I was 12, 13, 14. Cutting the chicken's head off, legs off, cutting some of the stuff, putting them in a pot, bringing the pot upstairs for the chef. And then when I did all that, I do, do the pots and pans for the breakfast, I do the dishes and all that stuff in the, in the dishwasher. That, that was kind of my introduction, like, you know, to working in restaurants. I did all this and, and graduated. I, I graduated from high school in, in 1946. When I graduated from high school, my brother and I went into Falmouth Athletic Hall of Fame, both my brother and myself. So we're in the Falmouth Athletic Hall of Fame to this day. And of course, my brother was really, they called him the Jim Thorp of New England. That's how good he was. And then I went in the Army, I signed up, I went to Fort Devens. I don't know if any of you remember Fort Devens, no longer there. Took my physical, got my physical, came back on home, and then they shipped me, gave me the, took the train, and went to Fort Dix, New Jersey. They played music all the time, and we marched all the time to the music. And we just kind of got introduced to what was going to go on. Left Fort Dix and went to Louisville. Not Louisville, Louisville, <laughs> Kentucky, Fort Knox. Had my, had my uh, you know, training there. I trained on, guess what? Guns and a 105 howitzer, which is a great, huge gun. It has about five or six people operating it. Somebody to put the shell, get the shell, somebody to put the shell in, somebody to pull the lanyard, somebody to direct the, the keeper. And so we had to do all the different parts. And I said, boy, I can't wait till I get out of the army. When I go home, I can take this howitzer with me and go rabbit hunting. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I left, I left Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I was en route. I went home first and they called it home and, and, and then to California en route. So on the way home and then back and went to California on the train. Took, had my bag and everything and I ended up at Camp Stoneman in California, which was the Repel Depot where they put you where you were gonna go. I went there from uh, Camp Stoneman to San Francisco on the eve of Christmas Eve, got into the ship, and they gave me sauerkraut and hot dogs <laughs> for supper. They said they're supposed to settle your stomach. From the day I got on board the ship, my name of my ship was, it was a Liberty ship. A Liberty ship had two stacks where the motor engines were. And, and the Liberty ship was called the John S. Carver. Usually it would take 14 to 15 days to get to where I was going. I was going to Korea. This time it took us 23 days because one, one, of, one of the engines broke down. 
You talk about sick as a dog. I don't know how sick a dog can get. <laughs> but I, I wanted to die. Really. I wanted to die. I would drink cold water. And before I got back to my bunk, I would throw up cold water. By the time I got off the ship in Yang Dung Po, what's the name? And it was on kind of the border of China and Korea. Yang Dung Po. They had to put me in a hospital. I was dehydrated. I had strep throat. And I was just worn out completely. I was there 14 days. Then they shipped me to my station, Chin He. Chin He to this day is kind of like an oyster harbor's place. It was on the ocean, and the Japanese had run it early on, and there were all kinds of sheds and places there. And so I became, I became a, a driver, a truck driver, and I drove half tracks. And when I drove the half track, I would pull howitzers around in our things that we were doing. I would then, I said, gee, I, I, I really don't want to do this to my sergeant. I said, can I get, get into a different area? He was an Indian guy from Oklahoma, so we became really good friends. So I got shipped to Pusan. And that's when, let's see, that's when I got into the uh, combat engineer outfit. 80th engineer, and he had it all down. He, he did a good job, summary, I tell you. 80th engineer, base depot. I was a technician. I became a, a, a grade four technician. I ran bulldozers, I ran cranes, I ran lifts, everything. We were bringing in all the building material for the United States troops that were going to be sent to Korea to help the Koreans get resettled. Got, got sent back home to California and discharged. Took the train home from Boston, from across the country. I stopped in uh, Omaha, Nebraska for three days. I don't know why I stopped there, but <laughs> it was a good stop. And I can say to this day, I was in Omaha. <laughs> I got off in Chicago, which in those days was a very small city. I loved it, and, and it was a city that you could see the sun all day. Today, you go to Chicago, you can, can never see the sun because of the tall buildings. I loved it, and Mayor Daly, the grandfather, was the mayor. And any of you remember Chicago in the early? Mayor Daly was a really big guy, and his son was the mayor later. And when you, when you were in Chicago, if you had a uniform on, you could get certain deals on things. You know, you could get to the movies uh, half price, uh, restaurants half price, uh, different things, uh, no price at all. Great city, really very interesting city. Headed along to New York, grabbed a train out of New York, went into Boston, and ended up in Hyannis when the train ended on the Cape in Hyannis. Got off in Hyannis with my duffel bag, three dollars to get a taxi cab home to Mashpee. Now three dollars in those days, that, that was a pretty good pay to go to Mashpee. I surprised my mother and returned to Civilian life. And when I returned to civilian life, the state gave us $200 so we could buy clothes and things to, from our army wear and so forth. And the, the government gave us 5220. Now, 52 was in the year, uh, the number of months, I mean, number of days or weeks or something. And 52, you got, you got 
every week for 52 weeks until you found a job. Well, I immediately got a job. I went to Parpanasset with my father, and I, I got a job working there, paint, painting cottages and getting things ready and so forth. I never collected the 5220, but I did use the $200. I bought a, oh, I can't think of the material, a double-breasted, oh, as the material that they made was kind of heavy, a double-breasted suit. Huh? No, it was a name. Huh? No. It was kind of heavier than a gabardine. Yeah. Anyway, I bought it, put that double-breasted on, boy. I thought I didn't... Oh, I, I thought I was a swinger. <laughs> oh, that suit. I, I still have that suit, never wore out. <laughs> anyway. Got a job driving a truck here and digging cesspools. We used to dig cesspools, you know. They didn't have tractors. A six by six, two people and a truck. And you'd start the six foot wide, start digging with a regular shovel. By the time you got halfway down, you had a long handle shovel. By the time you were finished, all you could see was sand going up in the shovel, going above it. Because it couldn't see you down there. Then, they have to put a ladder down for you to go up. <laughs> While you were down there, you'd have to move over and he'd throw, the person that was working with you would throw the blocks down. Or you're laying them up to make the, the cesspool. I says, this, this ain't for me. <laughs> ah, I didn't mind work, but I didn't like that. That's when I got the job at Papa Nesset. Oh, Lord. Call, the, the, the cottages there, they had the individual cottages. One of the hurricanes, I think, I don't know if it was 38, I think, where it blew all the pine trees down and everything at Papanesset. We had a buffet every Sunday. Oh, my Lord. Adrian Yell was my mentor, and he was the head chef there. Hilda Coppage, who was Edna Harris's daughter. Edna Harris built Kunamesset. Edna Harris's daughter, Hilda Coppage, ran Papanesset, and a great person. I spent, and my sister Delphina worked there, by the way, also. And, and we had people from everywhere. We used to serve uh, pickled tripe. And, and we would start a blanchet to get rid of some of the vinegar. And then we would put it in an egg wash and put it in saltine and brown it up nice and crisp and, and have a, 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 a mustard onion sauce to put on that tripe. Uh, people would come from Providence and up and North Shore, come down to have that tripe. And a buffet every Sunday. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, let's see. Um, my mother said to you about building a restaurant. Said you work so hard for everybody else. And I was at Papanesset for, for 24 years. The last two years of that I spent in West Falmouth because they didn't re renew her lease in Papanesset because she was making so much money. This is true. So she moved, took the name and went to West Falmouth. And she called the place over in West Falmouth. The building is still there. There was some kind of, I called it a castle. Like it, it was, it was a, they had plays there and stuff like that early on. And uh, um, we moved over there and called it Papanesset West. It never made it too big. And that's when I built my own restaurant. My mother said to build it. 1972. Menus. Menus were Janice and I. Janice, 
Margerson and I built this restaurant. My mother gave us the property. Beautiful building. You can see the portions of the beautiful building because it's a beer place now, but the basic building is still there. And in the meantime, in 19, I got a job teaching school. Harry Mercer was the superintendent, and I graduated from college. And at, while at college, I, the first year that I played football, I was voted the most valuable player during that season at the college football. And we sent from Arnold College, we sent a lot of people to the, for the big leagues. I went to go because they, 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 uh, they invited me because I knew people who were there. And then we, I talked to them and I already had, had, had two kids. I said, no, you don't have good insurance. So my two daughters are here. My first two daughters are here. I got two, three beautiful girls and two of them are right here right now. Why are you looking around? Huh? <laughs> Roxanne and Shelly, I, I, I want to tell you one thing. I am blessed with my children. Good education, good background, good jobs. We still have the homestead in Falmouth, have the homestead in Mashpee, have the compound in Mashpee where Shelly lives and Robert lives and, and your mailman, your mailman <laughs> lives. And Nancy, my youngest, with, my, with a lady who helped me do the restaurant, Janice Margison. She's in Florida. She graduated from Cornell, uh, uh, was going to be uh, you know, into the um, restaurant business, Indianapolis, Chicago, so forth. Got, so she hated it, went to Harvard, got a degree in reading and Latin and English and, and that, and went and taught school in English. She just stepped down from English and she's doing something else right now in Florida. Let's see, where are we now? How the menu there? Oh, and I, I just want to tell you the kinds of things that we had at the restaurant. We had, most of the things we had, I, ha I ate as a young boy. There's never been a restaurant like it anywhere, and there never will be again. And the things that we had, as you can see, Janice did the, the writing on them. She did the rest menus. And on the back would be some things about, you know, um, dear folks, welcome to the flume, so forth. Today's extra specials. And... Uh, and enjoy your meal. Be happy to host your special group luncheon party here at the Flume, so forth. Some of the things that we had, broiled squad with lemon butter, or lobster sauce. Not only did you get lobster sauce, but you got at five to six pieces of lobster meat in that lobster sauce. Because I said to my servers, Make sure that that happens. That, guess what that was? The cost eight fifty <laughs> for the lobster sauce one eleven fifty. Broiled swordfish with anchovy butter, roast duckling with apple soft stuffing and natural gravy, or an orange flaming duck. The best orange flaming duck I ever tasted was the one I I made. <laughs> it's true. I sold more duck than any place I ever knew. Uh, native scallops, pot roast, scrod au gratin, big handful of cheese on top of a cream sauce over scrod. Finn and Hattie. How many people from Nova Scotia here, families? Of course, you're a herring choker. You know what Finn and Hattie is. Sure you do. She's going, yeah. Finn and Hattie, smoked haddock. Put it in the casserole. Put some light cream or heavy cream in the casserole. Put a little bit of roux. What's roux? Roux is a thickening. It's a, it's a, it's a oil or grease 
and butter, usually butter and flour. Put a little bit of that in the bottom. Saute some onions, put it on the top. Put it in the oven and bake it. Let that cream kind of thicken up and bubble up over that browned onion. Take some crusted bread like the Portuguese bread. We used to toast it. And you could have buttered toast, uh, or, or garlic buttered toast, or Parmesan buttered toast. People would come in before they sat down. Well, could we have a basket of toast now? <laughs> Eat the whole thing before they got their meal. Could we have a few more uh, pieces of, t of bread? And near the end, when they were finishing, they'd say, can we have some more bread? Because they wanted to take it home. <laughs> Broiled native bluefish with lemon butter. If we had bluefish left over, we would put on a special of what? Bluefish hash. Oh. Bluefish hash. Oh, my God. Chicken William was a, was, a, was a dish that Melia's Cafe up the street. Melia's Cafe, they came from all over the Cape, an Italian place. Melia worked at the Hotel Adequin in the early years, and then she built the cafe. The build, building is still there. Chicken pot pie was a good number. Fr fresh oysters, fried or scalloped. You know what a scalloped oysters are? It's for people who really don't like oysters. You, you put a little butter in the bottom of a casserole. You, you, you do some uh, saltines, or you can use them with, with the salt or without the salt. Crush them up a little bit. Put them in the bottom of the, with the butter. Put the oysters on top of the, of the crackers, and then have some buttered crackers all set, and put them on the top of those oysters. A little more butter. Put it in the oven and bake it. Let it bubble around the side. <laughs> As the Mashpee folks would say when they're having something good and they were enjoying it, they'd say, oh, don't. Oh, don't. That's all they'd say. <laughs> Fresh oysters, fried clam. My, my fried clams are still the best. Why? Because I had the best breading. I made my own breading. And you weren't eating breading, you were eating clams that had been breaded. Put the clams in the breading, put your hands in there, shake them around, shake them on, then shake it off. Put them in the f clean fat, brown them. Take a fork, just pull them in case anything stuck together. Brown them just right, not too dark. Oh, don't. Okay, 16-ounce steak, sirloin steak, junior steak, lobster Newburg, and casserole. Boy, I make the best lobster Newburg, I'll tell you. I mean it. Big stuffed lobster. That was started by Edna Harris. Edna Harris started the big stuffed lobster. When I worked with her for six years, she used to tell people, he's my best cook. Well, I never thought I was the best, but if she said it, I, it was okay for me. <laughs> okay. Things like, then we'd have little thing, things like uh, that you had just, just the bread and, and a vegetable with. We have fried smelts. Oh, boy. Fried smelts. Fish and chips. And sometimes we'd have three or four different kinds of fish. You know, we'd say, you want the squad, the haddock, bluefish, or swordfish? or you want one of each. <laughs> really? Swordfish made good fried fish. People say, swordfish? Yes, little pieces of swordfish we had. Fish cakes and beans. We baked our own beans, codfish cakes and beans. We baked pea beans and kidney beans in our oven. And we would have frankfurters, franks and beans, or linguita and beans. Or you could have beans on the side. And if you had things like baked ham, we'd have a sauce. I'd have a piquant sauce that I served with a ham that was made with a ham dripping. Oh, God. Made that ham just a little more moist. And when I had ham, I always had a wet potato. By that I mean 
au gratin potato with ham, a scallop potato with ham, cream potato with the ham, baked ham, turkey on Sunday with all the fixings, family style. They came from everywhere across the state on Sunday. Butternut squash, all the vegetables. People weren't eating vegetables until they started coming to the flume. And I cooked them properly. Harvard beets, buttered corn, buttered corn on the cob that we, we steamed it good in a little water, put a whole lot of milk in the, in the corn so it wouldn't dry out and get tough, put an ear on a separate dish, put some butter on the side, and you had corn on the cob. Harvard beets, buttered beets, peas, um, oh God, what other kinds of things, Shell? Oh, yes, other thing. We had herring roe from the river, right down below. Herring roe and a couple of slices of bacon, like you would cow's liver. Cow's liver and bacon. Big at Kunameset and big in my restaurant. At Kunameset, they'd say first before they came in, well, is zero on cooking today? If I wasn't, they wouldn't order the liver. <laughs> true, true. Let's see, what else here? Vegetarian plate, had all kinds of vegetables. Fried shrimp plate, lobster salad plate, jag and linguisa, an old Cape Verdean dish. Let's see, ro oh, hash, roast beef hash. People say, oh, bet you a lot of men ordered that. No, more women ordered roast beef hash and corned beef hash and, and, and turkey hash than men. And turkey hash, if I had any of that left, we used to feed the kids. The, the waiters and waitresses would say, oh, you got any of that turkey hash left? Delicious, delicious. Chicken salad, boiled dinner. Oh, we have a boiled dinner, second to none. And the gray corned beef, not the red, gray. Boiled tater, onion, beets, Carrots, parsnips, uh, what else? And corned beef with, with horseradish sauce on the side. All I can tell you is, let's see, how long did I have that? I had that, I think you had it right too. I had the, the restaurant until uh, 19, 19? 2004, yes, yes, from 1972. I stay in touch with all the kids that I worked with, Papa Nesset and in my restaurant. Papa Nesset would be teachers who were off for the summer that would work with us. In my restaurant, it was the locals plus friends of my kids that were friends of mine that, that were from maybe Marshop Village or were friends and their kids would work on their off time from college. What else did I do? Let's see. I'm about there. I think that's about it, folks. Um, what else did I have? Did I, uh, oh, did I say I was uh, uh, elected for the Hall of Fame? Yeah. Falmouth, yeah. About some of the work you did with the tribe. And oh, the tribe, well, yeah. See, my name, my name at birth was Pathfinder. Oh. I, uh, Flying Eagle didn't, and the, 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 the medicine man, Reverend Perry, said, yeah, you're a Flying Eagle, you're not a Pathfinder. But I always liked Pathfinder. Went to every, everything, all down to Providence where all the people were killed in the swamp down there. And we exchanged things. We met and exchanged things. Started, to, restarted the powwows after the war, 1956. Met people from Virginia, uh, from down in Maryland, native people, up into Maine, 
over into New York along the Six Nations, and they would all come to the powerhouse with their stands and their food and dancing and singing and all in regalia. My girls were, my girls were, I, I built a house in, in Falmouth and the girls, I'd say, okay, we're gonna have a radio station now. Uh, and I'd, I'd say, okay, Shelly, you're gonna do a dance. Now I'd say, featuring Shelly Mill doing the Indian dance. And she, cause she'd grin and get all bashful, you know, and she'd go do the dance. And we'd all clap, and then Roxy would do something. But they were dancing from the time they were old enough to dance and sing. And they were part of going to the different places and visiting and, and exchanging honorary things and, and then changing uh, uh, things that they were doing and how they were doing it and what we were doing. And inviting them and putting them up putting them up in the houses of the people here. I used to rent the Trout Pond Cottages. I don't know how many of you knew the Trout Pond Cottages at Mashpee Rotary. There were cottages back there. I used to rent four or five of them for the people who were in the powwows. Because we didn't pay them, but we tried to reimburse them for coming. That's kind of the way it was. And uh, you know, I had the kids along the way, and uh, we've done some kind of fun things together, and it's, it's, been, it's, it's been a trip so far. Uh, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. And, um, Are your cookbooks available? I have to order more, and I, I'm in hopes, because that's, 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 the, that's the one that people really like. Because a lot of people that buy cookbooks, they, they don't really cook. They, they like to have the cookbook. And my cookbooks have a lot of stories. My cookbook has a lot of stories with it about eels. Oh, I forgot to tell you some of the things that we had. Wait a minute now. Some of the people that came to the restaurant, just a few. The donut man. Remember the donut man? Time to make the donuts. Uh, uh, you remember the corporal from MASH? Yeah. He came. The corporal, the one that was in charge. Um, let's see. A guy was talk show host, and he lived in Centerville. And when he was in, he used to go back and forth to California. And one day, uh, when he was in California doing the program, there was a girl, lady on the program that said, well, I just had some fried clams from up in Maine. And she said, they were the best in New England. And he got on, a, on that horn and he said, oh, no, 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 no way. He said, you have to go to the Flume in Mashpee to get the good fried clams. People came from all over the place. We heard it on, t on the radio. And we did. We had better than Maine. <laughs> I've been to Maine and had fish chowder. Oh my God, I wouldn't serve it to my... <laughs> really, really. It, it, it's, it, it just is... That's what we had too. Fish chowder. All kinds of soups and chowders. Quag chowder. Corn chowder. Clear chowder. A consomme. You know, on and on. Oh, and the desserts. <laughs> People would say, can I have my dessert now? So they make sure they'd get it. <laughs> yes, because see, the desserts wouldn't, couldn't carry them over, except maybe gingerbread with whipped cream on it. Like, you, know, you could freeze the gingerbread, but you couldn't freeze a Boston, I mean, a, um, a banana cream pie. Coconut cream pie, chocolate cream pie, <laughs> blueberry, little blueberry pies. Uh, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. And then uh, during the season, strawberry rhubarb pie, pumpkin squash pie during Thanksgiving, apple pie, deep dish apple pie, apple pie. And Delcina was a genius. 
If she walked in your house and you had been cooking all week and you had stuff in your refrigerator, she could go in your refrigerator, pull out different things, cook it off, and you say, oh my God, this is wonderful. That's how good it was. So all of those kinds of things made the restaurant what it was. So that about sums it up, I guess. And you have some questions. with the young children and the dancing and the moves and the closeness of some people that were there from other tribes to support you. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about your tribe. You want to talk about that, Rocky? I can. Roxanne, uh, my daughter Roxanne uh, had a full scholarship to S Simmons. You know where Simmons in part? Good school, good school. She didn't like it. She, could, she couldn't get used to the, the Jewish people that were there. They were kind of cliquish. She said, she said Dad, we, I grew up among Jewish people, but these were the, the ones that you know, didn't have milk with such and such and such. What do you call that, do you call it? Yeah, but they, they were hard to get part of. So she hitchhiked to, uh, New Mexico, and ended up in, uh, uh, in Albuquerque and went to the University of New Mexico in, in Albuquerque. So go ahead, tell us. Okay. Kui Kwasa de Mo, good morning. Um, just quickly about um, the education and cultural teachings. I just happened to be the education director for the tribe. But some of the things that we do, because families these days, we grew up with our family being taught, and like Dad said, we visited other tribes, and tribes came here, and we incorporated different uh, kind of Pan-Indian cultures. But we have culture nights every couple of weeks uh, for our young people. We have our drum, and we have mentors that uh, take the kids and model for the kids for dance and song. Um, we just got through uh, a six-week program building a machine, a new dugout, and so we had about 20 youth burning that dugout uh, during the course of those six weeks with a couple of overnight burns. And so this Sunday at the Mashpee Wakefield Pond, they'll be launching that. There's a lot of activity around the water and protecting the water. Um, those types of activities Thank going on on you. Sunday morning. Uh, so about 9 or 10 o'clock on Sunday, they'll be down there with the kids to launch the machine. Um, and soon after that, the children that participated and their families will um, be honored with a clam boil. So those are some of the things we do. Um, we, we go to the schools. We work with, with seven school districts, including Mashpee. Uh, to, and we're in the classroom working with teachers to enhance the curriculum so that they can include uh, factual information about first Wampanoags and then Native Americans just generally. So we work with pre-K through 12 um, and we're in our infancy in doing this with the help of um, federal grants. But those are the those are the types of things we do. We do a lot of modeling. We have a lot of activity at our powwow grounds and in our building on um, great networks. So, hope that answers your question. Thank you. I think one of the things I have to say is we, we were in all kinds of magazines and all kinds of people from the state. All, all the news media people, all the athletics from Celtics and and, and uh, the football team would come to the, to the restaurant uh, and, and, and people like that. And, and, and we were in Gourmet Magazine three different times. Now, Gourmet Magazine was the top cooking magazine in the country. 
I would have people come from California with the magazine. And we're here visiting because we saw the article and we knew we were going to the Cape. That kind of thing. People would call from overseas, from England. We're going to be in Mashpee on the 18th. We need a reservation. <laughs> true, true. Go ahead. Any other questions? Burial mounds, yeah. The bur see here, you you got you got you got to consider that it's 400 years. Some other places, it's only like 150 years since those mounds and stuff. The mounds here were more stones, and so w when they began building fences, for instance, a stone wall built by an Indian always left. Holes. They didn't try to pe make the stones fit all together. They left openings in the stone. Why? They were, the spirit of the wind had to pass through. The wind is a spirit. The sky is a spirit. The moon is a spirit. And they all have Indian names. And so as a result, that, that, that's really very important. Now, say what you said again. What did she say? The mound. The mound. So the mound, they would take the stones and they wouldn't realize they were desecrating a grave. For instance, we had the, the, what they called a, um, see, I forget. It's an Indian word, but it means spirit world. Spirit, place, spirit is here. And it's an area that, that would be telling the seasons. It'd be a stone with a cut in it, another stone down here, so that when that sulfurous came, the sun would come through that area, hit that stone there, hit this stone. Well, they used those stones to put in rip wrap and all that stuff without really realizing they were really desecrating a whole system, you see? And, and up in Falmouth, particularly up there in the, in the wooded area up behind, there were a whole lot of areas up there. And, and some of the places that, of course, have markings and stuff on them, they didn't disturb, but most of them were disturbed pretty much. And, and we thank you very much, Chief, for, for making time this morning and to your family as well, to the, to the uh, daughters who have been front runners in your rejuvenation, your regeneration of the tribal ways, the customs, the logic, the, uh, the heritage that you convey so well to so many people. And we're delighted that you spent time with a, with a group of us from Southport today. Thank you very much, Chief. <laughs>